Morning, Life Point Church. My name is Brady, and I am an imperfect follower of Jesus. And if you're new here, that's what we are. We're just a bunch of imperfect people, a bunch of broken people, hoping to strive to reorient our lives around Jesus, being with Him, becoming like Him, and partnering with Him on His mission together in community. And this is a time where we come, and I see this as the culmination of the week and the springboard for the next week, that we get to worship Jesus as a culmination of our praise every single day, and also as the the fire and the energy and the excitement to get to now springboard into the next week as we encounter his word together. Um, Just so you know, we're not going to be talking about anything controversial today. Uh, Jesus just talks about marriage, and he talks about singleness, and he talks about divorce, and he talks about gender, and he talks about sexuality, and so it's going to be fine. Just, just kind of go on autopilot today. Um, <laughs> he uh, just, just to kind of catches up. We're in the book of Matthew, and it begins by Jesus making this very powerful announcement. He says, "Repent," which means to turn, because the kingdom of heaven is breaking in to this planet. Jesus assumes that we're going the wrong way, that we are headed away from the kingdom of heaven. Just naturally, we all head away from the kingdom of heaven. Uh, It's like we're in this river, and the river is going a certain way, and if we just float, we're going to head in that direction. And Jesus says, oh, by the way, that direction is the wrong way. So if you're in the Mississippi and you're headed toward the Gulf of Mexico, that's the wrong way. You need to be headed the other way. So we need to turn. We need to repent and embrace his kingdom, his will, his way, his lordship. That's the whole message of Jesus boiled down into one sentence. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as I'm sure you know, as a follower of Jesus, that's a daily thing. It is a daily turning. It's a daily reminding. It's a daily reorienting around Jesus because naturally we just float downstream. And we're in a particular section where Jesus talks about what sin will do. The disciples ask a question and the question reveals that there's sin in their own hearts. There's pride in their hearts. And he says, you just need to know that sin will destroy your community. It will corrupt your community. It has this corrosive nature to it that just ruins relationships. So take it seriously. Realize that you have sin in your own heart and your mind. All of us, me, all of us, we all have sin in our own hearts and our own minds. And we need to take it seriously. We need to deal with it. And then everyone else also has sin in their hearts and their minds. And we need to deal with that together as a community. And we we need to deal with it with grace, just like Jesus. We need to deal with it in a way that we desire reconciliation of a relationship. Not punishment, but reconciliation. And we need to forgive one another. And then Jesus begins to give a very practical aspect as another question is asked. But, but that relates to what we've just been talking about. Um, Jesus is going to really hit on some stuff. Some hot button, highly debated, controversial issues. Issues that speak to our core desires, our longings, our yearnings, our identity. It's a big deal. So here's the deal. I'm not sure if this will apply to you, but if you fit into one of these categories, then this morning what Jesus says will likely apply. So if you're single, if you're blissfully married, if you're unhappily married, if you're divorced, if you have kids, if you're unable to have kids, or if you identify with the LGBTQ plus community, this message will apply. This, this message applies to me, and so I'm guessing if you have a pulse, this message applies to you as well. And, and here's the deal. This message has the opportunity, what Jesus says has the opportunity to speak deeply to your heart and your mind if you're willing. If you're willing to encounter Jesus as he is. If you're willing to trust Jesus. If you're willing to believe that Jesus is good, that he loves you and he desires good for you. And we're just saying about the goodness of God. 
We sing that his goodness is running after us. It's chasing after us. But this goes to the core of our humanity. This is back to the Genesis chapter 3, the very beginning. The, the temptation of Satan at the very beginning was, will you trust God? Do you believe he's good? Do you believe he desires good for you? Or do you think that God is holding out on you? Do you think that God is giving you all of these desires, these yearnings, all this potential for great excitement, and then he says, nope, I don't want you to do that. Nope, I don't want you to experience that. Nope, I want you to experience self-control. And then he just is up there laughing at us, going, oh, this is going to be fun. What do you think about God? I mean, this, this goes to the core of what do you think about God? Do you believe he's good? And can you trust him even when it gets difficult, even when it speaks deeply to your heart, to your mind, to your body, or not. But I believe that if we're willing to trust him, that, that Jesus will shine a light that can mature into great freedom and beauty in our lives. And if not, if we're not willing, then this, this passage has the potential to bring frustration, bitterness, and anger. And so I'm gonna pray for us that our hearts would be open to Jesus and his way. Heavenly Father, we need you right now. There's a lot going on, just in general. I just pray that as we encounter your word, you would help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to trust. And when we encounter things that are difficult, I pray that we'd just be able to trust and to at least just sit with it for a moment and allow your spirit to, to reveal the great beauties in your words. I pray that you would lead us all into freedom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we enter into this, you're going to need to ask yourself, what do you think about marriage? What's the point? What's the purpose of marriage? What do you think about singleness? What do you think about single people? What do you think about sexuality? What do you think about gender identity? What does that mean to you? And then what does Jesus say? And how is that going to speak to where you are? Um, you know, these things speak to each of us individually, but they also speak to those of us that we know and love. And, and this, these things are powerful. And just be ready. So here's what happens. Matthew chapter 19. If you have a Bible and you want to read along with us, you can turn to Matthew chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 1. If not, the verses are going to be on the screen. And in Matthew chapter 19, a group of people come up to Jesus. And here's what happens. It says, now when Jesus finished these sayings, so Jesus, remember, he was up north at Capernaum. Uh, he was, uh, sorry, up north at Caesarea Philippi. Then he went down to Capernaum, which is right around the Sea of Galilee. And now it's saying he's journeying down further toward Jerusalem. When he had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea, beyond the Jordan. Now, your mind, if you're an Israelite, you're flashing back towards the, the wilderness wanderings, right? All of the people of Israel, they were wandering in the wilderness, and they came up on the east side of the Jordan River, and then they crossed over the Jordan River into the promised land. And so Jesus, right before he heads to Jerusalem to institute the new covenant and the new Israel, he gets over on the east side of the Jordan, and then he crosses over. So this is a big deal right? This is setting us up to begin to think things, to, to journey back into the scriptures. It says, and large crowds follow, followed him, and he healed them there. Now, in verse 3, a group of people come up to him, and Pharisees, these are the religious leaders, these are the people that know the scriptures backwards and forwards, and the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, you can tell just by the way that it's described that there's something going on here. What these people are doing is they're trying to bait Jesus. Have you ever been in a conversation, whether in person or on social media, where someone was trying to bait you into something, trying to bait you into responding a certain way, trying to get you to enter into a debate that you don't want to enter into? That's what they're doing. They're trying to bait Jesus to enter into the most hotly contested debate of their day. In our day and age, think gun control. Think, you know, when they ask a political, um, someone who's running for political office, what's your position on gun control? What's your position on parental rights when it comes to a child wanting to get an abortion or wanting to uh, change their gender identity? 
That would be a big deal. What, what, what's your position on same-sex marriage? Right? If you imagine what that would be like for uh, someone running for political office to get asked that question and just waiting, just, just waiting for what's going to happen. Because you know whoever's asking that question, they're going to take your words and they're going to pull it out of context and they're going to use it for their own purposes to try and destroy you, right? That's what happens in our world, our day and age. Same thing. This question that they're asking is, they, is a debate. It's a raging debate that was going on in that day and age. It was, it was huge. It was a big deal. And they want Jesus to speak on it so that they can have reason to ruin his reputation. And you see this in their motivation. It says they, they were testing him. They asked, they asked this to test him. And then you begin to see what's going on in their heart and their minds. They ask, is it lawful or is it permissible? Like, what are we allowed to do? They're not asking, what is the meaning? What is the purpose? What, what is the foundational core idea? Why was marriage created? They're saying, how far can we go? What is it, what is, is it permissible to divorce your wife for any cause? And also look at what they say. Is it permissible for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? So you kind of already see some stuff that's going on. Even if you're just reading it in the English, even if you don't you know, ha, you know, know about first century Jewish cultural context, you can already see what's going on. But just to kind of give us a little bit of context of where they are and what they're asking and what this debate is, we're going to journey back to Exodus chapter 21. There are two places in the Old Testament that talk about divorce law. And here's one of them, Exodus 21, verse 10 through 11. It says, if he, this would be a husband, takes another wife to himself. So this is God saying, um, I'm going to speak to this current culture. And the current culture of that day, Israel of that day, was a polygamous culture, meaning guys could have multiple wives. That was just the culture that God was entering into. So this isn't necessarily God's ideal, but he's taking the culture of Israel where they're at. He says, so if he takes another wife, so a second wife, he shall not diminish her food. So he's talking about now her, the first wife. He's saying, the husband now shall not diminish the food of the first wife, her clothing or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. Now what's going on here? If you remember uh, Jacob, he married uh, uh, Leah and then Rachel. And you know there was this, this debate going on between Rachel and Leah with their marital rights. And what can happen in a polygamous society and culture is women can be oppressed as they were in that day and age. That women became property in the minds of men. And so they acquired women like they acquired property. And if they acquired a second wife, God said, here's the deal. If you're going to do that, I want to protect your first wife. I want to speak into this culture and I want to bring a little bit more uh, justice to the situation that you're creating that has a lot of brokenness in it. And I'm going to make sure that she gets fed. I'm going to make sure that she still has clothing. And I'm going to make sure she still gets her marital rights, that you don't diminish any of those things. And if not, I want you to know that she gets to go free. In that day and age, um, in the surrounding cultures, uh, men basically owned their wives. And in some cultures, a man could divorce his wife, and he didn't have to give her any sort of certificate of divorce. Uh, he didn't have to do anything, but, but she was still legally his. He could leave her, he could leave the kids, and up to five years later, he could come back and still assert his rights over her and over the kids. So imagine how awful this would have been for a woman in that day and age. The husband leaves. He's the one that provides for her. And now, how is she going to provide? Well, she could try and get remarried, but no one's going to remarry her for up to five years because she could get remarried and that one husband could come back and say, no, no, she's mine. So God, in this culture, gives a lot of beauty and freedom and protection for these women who are being oppressed. And he says, hey, she can go out free without any sort of Payment of money. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, this is the second place it talks about divorce. He says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency 
in her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house and it continues on. This is one long run on sentence. But basically here's the idea that he begins to put forth for divorce as far as sexual immorality goes. He says, if there is sexual immorality, then what you have to do is you have to write her a certificate of divorce, meaning she now has a document that lets everyone know she has been divorced and she is free to remarry. So this is great protection for an oppressed uh, group of people, women. Now here would be Old Testament uh, grounds for divorce. The Old Testament recognizes four grounds for divorce, and it's put in the marriage vows for Jewish people uh, in the Old Testament. One, neglecting to provide food. That's from Exodus. Two, neglecting to provide clothing. Also from Exodus. Third, neglecting conjugal love. And then from Deuteronomy, committing adultery. Those are the four grounds for divorce in the Old Testament. Now, we're not going to get too deep into all what the Bible says about divorce in this particular passage. If you want to look more into that, we did a message only on divorce uh, back in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. And if you want to look into that, um, you're welcome to go back and, and uh, listen to that. But basically, what I want us to, to see is that in the Old Testament, God was standing up for a vulnerable group of people, for women, in the way that he allowed for divorce. Now, fast forward. About a generation before Jesus, there were two famous uh, Jewish rabbis. One was named Hillel and one was named Shammai. And they had these two schools of thought. Um, and these two schools of thought were, were uh, on a number of different issues. Shammai was a little bit more strict and Hillel was a little bit more liberal, a little bit more uh, open. And you'll see throughout Jesus' ministry, he might kind of lean towards Shammai sometimes and lean towards Hillel on other times because he was not a disciple of either. What Jesus continued to do was speak into the heart of things. But here's what was going on with Shammai. Shammai looked at Deuteronomy 24. And he said in Deuteronomy 24, when it says, when a husband finds some indecency, a cause for indecency, he said, the only thing there is sexual immorality. That's what it means. There's only one reason in Deuteronomy 24.1, and it is sexual immorality for grounds for divorce. Hillel, on the other side, he said, actually, I see in Deuteronomy trip, uh, chapter 24 two things. He says he can find a cause and he can find sexual immorality. Two things, sexual immorality and then a cause, which became basically anything. And so in that day and age, what had filtered down to Jesus' time was there was the most popular divorce, which was they called an any cause divorce. So you see it right there in the passage of scripture when, when the Pharisees ask, can you divorce your wife for any cause? Now in Deuteronomy 24, which is unique versus Exodus, is Deuteronomy 24 is only addressed to men. So the any cause divorce was something that only men could do. Only a man could divorce his wife for any cause. And with an any cause divorce, you didn't have to go to court. You just had to write her a certificate of divorce and send her out. And it became very liberal. So there was another rabbi that said, hey, if she displeases you in any way, if she's just displeasing to your eyes, you can get rid of her. You can send her out. And so by Jesus' day, this was by far the most popular divorce. When you look back at um, documents that, are, that have survived, uh, divorce documents that have survived, basically this is the only divorce that was used during that day and age. And you, you can see why. Because it's just an easy out. For men, it's an easy out. So in a patriarchal society where men held the power, where men had the prestige, this was the best thing, right? You could get out of marriage for any reason that you wanted, and it wasn't difficult. Didn't have to go to a judge, didn't have to get a ruling, didn't have to give like half of your stuff. All you had to do was write a certificate and send her away. And so the Pharisees, you can see where they're at. You, the question reveals their heart. For someone who was a part of an, who was for the any cause divorce, you can see what they believed the purpose of marriage was. They believed the purpose of marriage was to please men only. Right? The purpose of marriage was to please men. So as soon as a man was not pleased any longer, he could divorce his wife for any cause, any reason at all. 
That was the point of marriage in their eyes, in their mind, what they were thinking. And Jesus speaks into this. Now, and I love what he does. He doesn't at first enter into the debate, in, into that particular debate. He doesn't first go to Exodus and Deuteronomy, which is brilliant. Here's what he does. It says in verse 4, it says, And he answered, Have you not read? He's talking to Bible scholars who basically had the Bible memorized, okay? Have you not read? So there's some humor in this. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. See, Jesus sees into the heart of their question, and he speaks, rather, to, rather than speaking to Deuteronomy 24, he speaks in such a way that reveals and sheds light on what is God's heart with marriage, with identity, with humanity. Have you not read? Have you not read? Basically, he's saying, if you understand the Bible, if you know the Bible, you know the answer to this question. You should know God's heart if you know the scriptures. Which, by the way, gives us a great precedent to know how to answer difficult questions. If we have a difficult question, where should we go to find the answer? The Bible. Now, the Bible isn't an answer book. But what the Bible does is it reveals the heart of God. And what we are called to do as followers of Jesus is to, uh, to, to uh, envelop, to take on the heart of God and to display the heart of God. And so what we do is we go back to Scripture to be shaped by Scripture. And when Jesus is asked about marriage and divorce, he speaks really about identity. So he starts, and he says, from the beginning. So he recognizes that there's a design. From the beginning, humanity was designed in a certain way. We have trouble with this in our day and age. But this is what Jesus speaks to, that there was a design. He says, and he quotes two different places. He quotes from Genesis chapter 1, and he quotes from Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, uh, it's in the middle of creation. Uh, It's this beautiful moment where God pauses And he speaks the first poem in the Bible, and he says, let us create humanity in our image, in our likeness, and let them have dominion, let them rule. And then it says, God did that. So God created humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Jesus starts from that, right? Male and female. So he reminds them about Genesis chapter 1. And in Genesis chapter 1, this portion about humanity being created is all about our identity as image bearers of God. Jesus says, don't you understand who you are? You are image bearers of God. And humanity images God with male and female. That's what Genesis 1 says. That we are created in the image of God, male and female. That it takes both male and female to fully image God in the way humanity was created to image God. Meaning, men and women are both equal in the way that they image God together. One is not higher than the other. One is not above the other. We are equal together in the way that we image God. But in the way that the any cause divorce happened, how did they view men and women? that men were more important than than women, that they were not equal. So first, Jesus speaks to the equality of men and women, the beauty of the way that God created men and women equally to together image God. Secondly, that, that we image God together. We image God more fully together with men and women. And then he speaks to Genesis chapter two. In Genesis chapter 2, what you have is, you know, uh, both of them being formed, uh, uh, coming back together. And and it says, um, for this reason, the man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And and Jesus says, what God has joined together, let not humans separate. So there's a reason why someone might come to me and ask me to marry them. So if there's a couple... That, that is engaged, they might come to me and ask me to marry them as opposed to, um, uh, you know, another person who's not a pastor. Why, why might they ask a pastor 
and not a person who's not ordained. Because they believe that I have some sort of authority, right? To, to marry them, to join them. And I'm not even talking about the state and what is legal in our country or in other countries of the world. I'm talking about biblically speaking. See, we believe that God has given me an authority to do this. Whose authority is it? It's not mine. It's God's. Right? What God has joined together, what happens in a marriage is God joins two people together into a one flesh union. It's something that God does. And so Jesus says what God does, basically humans don't have the authority, right? What God joins, humans shouldn't separate. Jesus goes back to the heart of the matter. He says, we are created together, men and women, equally in the image of God. And what God joins together in marriage, we should not separate. What is the heart behind marriage? What is the heart behind our identity? That's where Jesus goes. That we, that's what he speaks to at the very beginning. Before he enters into this debate. Well, then the Pharisees, they press him. It says, they said to him, verse, uh, verse 7, they said to him, well, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. Basically, they're saying, we have read. Have you read? You know, there's this, you know, it's this debate. Jesus, have you read? Yeah, yeah, we've read. Have you read? What about Moses? Yeah, I know about Genesis 1 and 2, but what about Moses? Moses commanded us to give her a certificate of divorce. And Jesus says, I I think you're missing this a little bit. First of all, you need to understand that the reason God allowed for divorce was to protect women. This was God's grace, even in the midst of your hard-heartedness. Basically, hard-heartedness, it it would be stubborn refusal to submit, right? Stubborn Stubborn refusal or stubborn breaking, continuous breaking of God's commandment. That's what hard heartedness is. And I love what Jesus does. He actually pulls his punches. So at first, when they asked the question, he could have started and said, hey, just your question reveals that you have hard hearts. But he didn't do that. He stepped back as they tried to force him into this debate. And he said, let me talk about the heart of God. You want me to enter into this debate? I want to talk about the heart of God. I want to talk about the beauties of what God has done in humanity. The beauties of what God has done and is doing in marriage. I want to talk about the reason behind it. They're like, no, no, no. I want you to enter in the debate. And at that point, he says, well, what you're doing reveals that you have hard hearts. Moses allowed it. Allowed it. Didn't command it. He allowed it because your hearts are hard because the Pharisees believed, as many did at that time, is that the purpose of marriage was to please men only. And Jesus said, this view of marriage is a hard-hearted view of marriage. And then verse 9, Jesus continues. He says, but from the beginning, it was not so. Right? Moses allowed it, but from the beginning, it was not so. That's not the reason. That's not the purpose. That's not what God had in mind. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Basically, what Jesus is saying is this is a last resort for unrepentant, hard-hearted breaking of the marriage vows. Unrepentant, hard-hearted breaking of the marriage vows. And when Jesus says this, who is he standing up for? Once again, he's standing up for women. The oppressed group in that day and age right? Jesus speaks to his heart of justice for the poor and the powerless, the oppressed, the excluded, the overlooked. It's the Sermon on the Mount all over again. Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Blessed are the meek, blessed are the powerless. Jesus cares deeply for those people who don't have power, those people who are hurting, who are oppressed, who are overlooked. And in this case, it was women. And so Jesus once again stands up for them, Now, is this the only reason that someone can get divorced? Great question. Go listen to that message back, Matthew chapter 5. But here, Jesus, it seems to be, he's commenting on Deuteronomy 24 only. And he says, divorce is a last resort 
for unrepentant, hard-hearted breaking of the marriage vows. And really, what it shows is that the marriage isn't ended by the divorce. The marriage is ended by the person who breaks the vows over and over again. That divorce is just the legal stamp that demonstrates the reality of what has already happened in the marriage. Now, the disciples are, are standing by. They're listening in while Jesus is having this conversation with his Pharisees. And I'm betting they're like, what's he going to say? And then as he starts talking, they're, 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 they start freaking out. And you see it. It says in uh, verse 10, the disciples said to him, well, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. You can tell when Jesus takes a hard line approach to the reality of marriage, they're like, whoa, if it's that hard to get out of, then you probably shouldn't even get married. Jesus, what are you saying? And Jesus responded, no, 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 it's not that big a deal. I was just saying it for effect. That, no, that's not what he said. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this, but only to those whom it is given. Basically, yeah. Yep. Marriage is a big responsibility. It's a big responsibility. Some people can accept it, some people can't. See, sometimes when you read Jesus' words, it feels like they're just, they're just so kind and overflowing with grace and love. And it's like, oh, he's just my friend. And sometimes when Jesus speaks, he speaks into our hard heartedness and it's difficult and it's hard to receive. And this is one of those times. Jesus said, yeah, yep, you're right. This is a big deal. And then, and then he brings even more beauty to it. It's, this is incredible. Matthew chapter 19, verse 12, he says, For there are eunuchs, and, and a eunuch uh, is someone who is physically unable to uh, procreate. Uh, it says, For there are eunuchs who have been, been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. So he begins to use this category, eunuchs. And he says there, there are eunuchs. And so basically he's talking about people who cannot or will not have sex and will not get married. Now, this was uh, a very normal thing in that day and age when kings uh, would have a harem of, of women that were basically their property, and they needed to know, who am I going to get to take care of my harem, my property? Like, what kind of guy am I going to get? What kind of guy can I trust? And so what they would do is they would get a guy, a servant, and then they would castrate him so that they would know, he's not going to sleep with my wives. He's not going to sleep with my harem. And then that person, that servant, would take care of and be in charge of his harem. So Jesus says, there are those types of eunuchs. And everyone's like, well, yeah, we, we know that, Jesus. Why are you talking about this? But then he brings up this really unique thing. He says, there are some who are eunuchs at birth. There are some people who from birth are unable to procreate. There's some people who from birth, and let's put it in our day and age, in our language, who don't fit into the created binary of male and female for one reason or other. And there are a number of uh, like intersex conditions that people are born with, and Jesus recognizes this. He acknowledges this. He says at the beginning, there was a created beauty and a created order. There was a created uh, way. But what happened is sin entered into the world, and, he twi and it twisted things. It broke things. And now we all experience some level of brokenness in our bodies, in our minds, in our hearts. And one of those aspects of brokenness is that there are people who are born with some sort of intersex condition and cannot procreate and likely especially in that day and age would not get married because that's the case and then he does something revolutionary he does something super revolutionary see first he says marriage is about human identity it's about male and female equally imaging God and that marriage when two people come together in a one flesh union they display God's loving character in a powerful way Right? God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Perfect love in the, in the Trinity. And humanity, when a husband and wife come together in a marriage, they display the character of God uniquely. And everyone knew that. Everyone got that. 
Now, some people had, you know, obviously viewed it in a tarnished way. But Jesus brings back the light to what was already in Scripture. But then he adds something new. He adds something new. He said, singleness, people who choose to be single for the sake of the kingdom also display God. This is huge. This is something that they had never heard before. Jesus elevates singleness to equality with marriage in the ability to be useful for the kingdom of God. And Jesus uses himself as the quintessential example. Jesus was single and celibate and said with his own life that there is great purpose, meaning, and value for the kingdom in choosing to be single for God's glory, to better display the kingdom in your life. He was the first religious leader ever, historically, to elevate singleness like this. And basically what Jesus is saying to our day and age is you don't need to have sex to live a meaningful and fully fulfilled life. How does that speak to our culture? You don't need to have sex to live a meaningful and fully fulfilled life. I tell you what, if there's something more countercultural than that, I don't know what it is. Our culture is so saturated with sex and saying that that is the ultimate pleasure, that is the ultimate good, that is the ultimate thing that anyone and everyone can and should experience. In fact, that is so core to who you are. It is your identity. It is who you are. And so if you're not experiencing it, if you're not indulging in it, then you are repressing yourself. If someone is not letting you, they are oppressing you. Basically what Jesus is saying is life is not about happiness. Life isn't about our happiness. It's not about the quickest way to get a serotonin or dopamine or oxytocin or endorphins. It's not about the quickest path to feel good in your brain and in your body. That's not what life is about. Life is about the kingdom of God. It's in our created identity, Genesis chapter 1. And it's also in our opportunity in marriage and in singleness. That the point of life is to draw near to Jesus and allow him to make you look more like him so that you can be effective in displaying him to the world. We might call that being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and partnering with Jesus on his mission. That's what life is about. This is what Jesus is saying. This is what life is about. This is what's going to give you meaning. This is what's going to give you fulfillment. This is what's going to give you purpose. This is who you are. You are created to display God to the world. And what's brilliant is Jesus says you can do that in marriage, and you can do that in singleness. In marriage, you do this by loving one another. By sacrificing yourself, your wants, your desires, your needs, your rights for the good of the other person. When you do that and your spouse does that, you uniquely display the character of God and his love inside the Trinity. And then Jesus says, but you can also do that in singleness. That people choosing to be single for the kingdom of God equally displays the character and beauty of God. Here's what Jesus is saying. Marriage is a big deal. It's a big responsibility, but it's a beautiful gift. So is singleness. Both have eternal purpose and both have significance. Basically, if you are married, whether you're happily married or you're unhappily married, you have eternal purpose. You have kingdom significance right here and now. But he's also saying if you're divorced, you have eternal purpose and kingdom significance right now. And he's also saying if you're single, if you're not married, you have eternal significance. You have kingdom purpose right here and now. If you only experience same-sex attraction, you have eternal purpose and kingdom significance right here and now. If you're wrestling with your gender identity, you have eternal purpose and kingdom significance right here and now. We were all created 
with that same eternal purpose. And no matter what our circumstances are that we find ourselves, whether it's in our gender, or in our sexuality, or in our um, relationship status, we can use that for the glory of God to display his love, to display his kingdom, his goodness, and his beauty as we live out in obedience to Jesus, submitting to his will and walking in his footsteps. But we can only do that if we trust that he is good. That even though it doesn't seem good, even though it doesn't sound good, even though sometimes it doesn't feel good, either Jesus is good or he's not. Either he loves us or he doesn't. And we've got to choose. If he's good, then everything he says, everything he commands, everything he leads us into is ultimate ultimately good even this there's loads of grace for all of us who have messed up all of us who find ourselves not in the ideal and there's great purpose for each of us today that's how incredible our God is